Okay, it's all you. Okay. All right, let me get seated over here so I'm not in the right standing no in front of you. You can use that at the beginning out. Yep. Okay. Today we're going to be learning about Germany and its formation. Right here I have a picture of the German Imperial Eagle. Right? Looks pretty neat, huh? I like it. When I went to Germany, those things are everywhere. In the early 1800s, Germany was divided up into a number of small and medium-sized states. The German-speaking people were equally divided among these states, as well as Prussia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, at this time known as the Habsburg or Holy Roman Empire. Here you can see a picture of Germany, the red being its modern-day borders. All of these small little areas were independent countries. Think of the United States if each state was its own country. You can see how divided it is. Germany was just a collection of these tiny states. Between 1807 and 1812, the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte seized large amounts of German territory, breaking up the Holy Roman Empire and unifying these German states into a single collection known as the Rhine Confederation. That was done for administrative purposes. He didn't want to have to deal with each and every one of these tiny little nations. The reason that he was able to conquer Germany so easily was that each of these countries had its own military, had its own government, had its own taxes, its own economy. They were, in essence, their own country. So what Napoleon was able to do was just hit them off one at a time. There was no unity. He wasn't facing a large army. He was facing numerous small armies. So he was able to defeat them one at a time and take control of German territory. As the German people struggled to win their freedom, uh, some among them, later known as nationalists, began to call for a unified German state. They said that if we had a single German nation, we wouldn't have to worry about being picked on by other European powers. We'd be able to have our own strong military, our own strong economy. We wouldn't have to worry about countries like France or the Austrians coming in and taking parts of our nation. We would be able to call the shots in our own country. The first step that these early nationalists had was to create what was called the German Confederation. This was a loose alliance of German states headed by Austria, which allowed each German country, each of those German principalities, to retain control of its own government. What it basically was was an alliance similar to NATO, where they would say, if you're attacked, the rest of us will help you. It starts to unify the German military and the German governments. It signals a new era where these individual states are going to closely cooperate together. It, however, it was led by Austria, a foreign power. So the nationalists weren't very happy about that, but it was the best thing that they could achieve at this time. In the 1830s, Prussia creates a new economic unit called the Zollerweg, which dismantled trade barriers between many German states and unified them economically. Now Germany has a single unified economy. It's no longer small patchwork of tariffs and individual taxes. Instead, everything is a single flat rate, a single economy, similar to what Europe did late, much later with the EU. You can see the origins of it in the Zoller bed. In 1862, Otto von Bismarck was appointed Chancellor of Prussia, the most powerful of the German states. Otto von Bismarck's an incredibly important politician incredibly important for both German and European politics as a whole. Here's a picture of him later in life. He was a master of what was called real politic, the realistic policies based on the needs of the state. He didn't have single goals. He had the, his only goal was to strengthen Prussia. He didn't so much care about Germany as a country. He, didn't, he wasn't a nationalist. What he cared about was strengthening Prussia. And by unifying Germany under Prussia, he saw that he could make the Prussian king, King William I, a lot more powerful. He would be the emperor of the German people, rather than just the king of Prussia. Bismarck was a skilled negotiator. He was good at manipulating people. 
And what he would do was he would change his priorities, change his policies to suit the people under him. He kept everyone happy and won their loyalty rather than making enemies. As chancellor, Bismarck built up the Prussian army. He made it the most powerful and the most well-trained and the most technologically advanced army in all of Europe. And he began to use that well-trained, well-financed, well-armed, and well-led army to pursue an aggressive foreign policy. He starts using it to back up his ideas, back up his rhetoric. Here's a picture of the Prussian army in action. Over the next 10 years, Bismarck leads Prussia into three wars, each time winning and gaining Prussia more and more power, paving the way for German unity. He would seize territory. He would uh, use the seized money, the payments, to put right back into his military, growing the Prussian military, learning from its mistakes. And the Prussian army becomes a well-tooled, well-oiled war machine. In fact, Prussia begins to be called a nation or an army with a nation attached to it. That's how much emphasis they placed on their military. Here's a breakdown of those three wars. In 1864, Bismarck forms an alliance with Austria and seizes the provinces of Schleswig and Holstein from Denmark. Has anyone ever heard of a Holstein cow? The Holstein cow? That's where they come from, from Holstein. They divide, he then divides up the spoils of war with Austria. He divides up the territory and the money. Now, you might think Denmark isn't any big deal, but at this point in European history, the Danes were considered a formidable army. This gets the other powers of Europe's attention. Prussia comes out of nowhere, forms an alliance with Austria, one of the most powerful nations in Europe, and takes on Denmark, and Prussia is able to seize territories in Germany and absorb them. In 1866, in one of his most ruthless moves, Bismarck attacks Austria, his former ally. And following a short and decisive seven-week war, he annexes several North German states and dissolves the Austrian-led German Confederation, creating a new Prussian-led Confederation. Prussia is now first among the German states. He leads the new Confederation. Bismarck's able to defeat Prussia, or er, I'm sorry, Prussia is able to defeat Austria by using technological advances. They learn from their previous wars. They start using different tactics. They get a new rifle called the needle gun, which is able to fire much faster. It's a bolt action as compared to the Austrians' muzzle loaders. Here we're going to watch a short video on how the Prussians were able to make such rapid advances in technology, able to conquer the Austrians. Now the video is in German, because that's where it's from. It's from Germany. Would you like to hear it with volume or without? With. With volume. Okay, you want the full immersion experience. Very good. You don't want me to translate it yet. Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> Here you can see the two armies coming together. The Austrians stay standing up, that traditional Napoleonic style. The Russians, on the other hand, get in the prone position. There you can see the bolt action rifle. Here's a breakdown of the mechanism, how much faster it is. He uses a needle to pierce a lidded cartridge and ignite the primer, firing the charge. Bad day to be him. See how slow the muskets are to reload. In comparison, the Russians just have to put a new linen cartridge in. Now, let's compare the tactics of the two armies. The Austrians go marching into battle, line abreast, standing up. Why is that a bad idea? Bigger target. A bigger target. 
The Prussians, on the other hand, go charging into battle and lie down, getting into the prone position. Why is that a good idea? Less of a target, that's right. So, easy target, rapid rate of fire, makes for a bad day to be an Austrian soldier. Here you can see the <coughs> devastation. Now this is a reenactment, but it's based on battlefield accounts and on paintings that were done of the Prussian, Austro-Prussian War. Austria was one of the most powerful nations in Europe. I'm going to tell you that again because it's very important to understand this. Prussia is able to just come out of nowhere and take them on and win using this new technology. This makes the other powers in Europe very nervous, particularly France. France was the European heavyweight. They were the people that on the continent called all of the shots. They were able to basically control the rest of Europe as far as the continent goes. They had no rivals. All of a sudden, Prussia comes along. And in France, Emperor Napoleon III became increasingly concerned about Bismarck's bold actions. He sees that Bismarck is building up the Prussian army. He sees that under Bismarck, the Prussian army is taking over the German territories one at a time getting them to coalesce into a new, more powerful Prussia, forming the origins of Germany. In 1870, the rivalry between France and Prussia erupts into the Franco-Prussian War. After Bismarck, at perhaps one of his most manipulative and sneaky moves, uh, edits a dispatch from the German government to make it seem that William I of Prussia had insulted Napoleon III provoking Napoleon III to declare war on Prussia. This is called the Ems Telegram. And once again, I have a nice little video that can help you understand it better than I can explain it. It gives you a visual. You also get to see the way that the Prussians dress, the style of the era. It's just a very nice video all around. And best of all, this one's in English. Early in July 1870, the Chancellor of Prussia, Count Otto von Bismarck, one of the most ruthless diplomats in history, was interrupted at dinner by the arrival of a telegram from his king, William I of Prussia. The telegram described how the French ambassador, Benedetti, had been cordially received over a matter of the Spanish succession. The throne had been offered to a member of the Prussian royal family, a cousin of King William. Naturally, France objected to such a candidate, which ignored her own long-standing influence in Spain. King William, with no desire to provoke a war with France, assured Monsieur Benedetti that Prussia would forward no such candidate to the Spanish throne. Pleased with this resolution of the matter, <coughs> William gave his permission to Bismarck to publish the transcript of the meeting. Yet Bismarck had no intention of giving the French such satisfaction. Indeed, he had been waiting for just such an opportunity to provoke war, and so altered the wording of the telegram to suggest that Benedetti had been dismissed out of hand. The so-called Ems telegram arrived in Paris on the 14th of July, Bastille. Its effect was explosive. The French were outraged, and within just five days, declared war on Prussia and her German allies. The Franco-Prussian War had begun, and within months, an empire. An empire was born. Anyone want to guess what empire that was? Huh? What empire would it be? What empire is born? The German Empire, correct. In 1870, France was considered the most powerful continental army, the most powerful continental country, the most powerful nation in continental Europe. 
Sure, Britain controlled the seas, but when it came to land warfare, France considered itself undefeatable. They underestimate the Prussians. A superior Prussian force using more modern techniques, more modern tactics, is able to smash through the poorly led, poorly supplied French army. It was badly organized. It had poor leadership. The French thought that the Prussians would be a pushover, that they would basically retreat from the French just based on the French reputation. So they underestimate the Prussians, a crucial mistake. The Prussians push through the French army, break through the lines, and go right on to take Paris. The Prussians seize the French capital. The French are infuriated by this, to the point that Napoleon III is actually overthrown. And one of the new leaders of France, there were two rivals, is surrounded in the French capital. He winds up making a uh, daring escape via hot air balloon from the French capital. I just think that would be hilarious to imagine the French leader waving at the Prussians as he floats away. You better also hope that the wind was blowing in the right direction. Thankfully it was. After a few weeks, the French are forced to accept a humiliating surrender. This destroys French morale. It destroys France's reputation as a continental power. And it cements Prussia as the new military force in Europe. The victory of the unified German forces over France convinces the leaders of the individual German states, the princes, the kings, the leaders of the small principalities, to ask William I of Prussia to become Kaiser of the new German Empire. And in 1871, the Second German Reich is born. William I is crowned Kaiser of the Second Reich, the Second German Empire. A position of tremendous authority. And guess who also plays an incredibly important role in the formation of the German Empire? What's his name? Chancellor Bismarck. Good. A constitution is written by Bismarck, establishing a two-house legislature, with the upper house called the Bundesrat, appointed by the leaders of the German states, the former rulers, those people who were the aristocrats, the ones that had controlled the small German countries. They're able to say, I appoint you to the Bundesrat to be our representative. The lower house, called the Reichstag, which is still part of the German government, is elected by universal male suffrage. At the time, this was a very revolutionary move. There was universal suffrage, universal voting for any men. This was for Europe, for continental Europe, for these former imperial powers, a tremendous move. In Russia, you didn't have the right to vote at all. In other nations, your right to vote was determined on how much land you had or how much money you had. In Germany, you were allowed to vote as long as you were male. Despite the division of government, though, Bismarck, at once again, his manipulative self, he was able to win people over, rigs the system. He ensures that real power remains in the hands of the emperor and the chancellor. The way that he does this is, although the uh, Reichstag was elected by universal male suffrage, every bill that it proposes has to be approved by the Bundesrat, which is appointed by the aristocrats, by the upper echelons of German society. In turn, any bill that gets through the Bundesrat has to be approved by the Chancellor and the Emperor. This means that they get the final say in how the German government works. Anyone that is elected doesn't really have a say. It's only those who are at the top rungs of government power that have any real control. The rise of a unified Germany set, uh, is, ushers in a new era in European politics. France was no longer the dominant continental force. Their image had been shattered something that the French don't get over. 
they carry that bitter memory of their defeat for decades afterward. And Britain starts to be threatened. Germany becomes a tremendous industrial power. It has large resources of coal, of iron, both of which, when you put them together, what do you wind up with? Steel. That's right. Steel, the measure of how industrialized the country is. Germany has some of the most powerful and the largest steel works in the world, Krupp Steel Works. It employs tens of thousands of people and pushes Germany uh, to the top tier of industrialization. Only the United States rivals Germany. They surpass Britain. Germany also now has a tremendous population, access to very important seaports, navigable rivers, and all of this put together with that industry means that Germany is able to acquire a large overseas empire rivaling Britain in terms of sheer power and global reach. This makes Britain, France, Russia, the traditional powers in Europe, very nervous. And so you start seeing alliances being formed between the European powers and the other nations. People start saying that if you're attacked, we will back you up. If we attack someone, you'll come in on our side and help us attack them. This leads to a tangled web of alliances and loyalties in Europe. What does that eventually result in? What war? Breaks out in 1914. World War One. that's right. World War One is a direct result of the German unification. The nervousness that those nations felt towards Germany's rising power. Is everyone comfortable with this material? Are there any questions? No? Then, I'm going to hand back your tests from yesterday, as well as any other materials that I might have. We're going to go over the test as well, make sure that everything was done correctly, and let you review all of your materials. Yeah. Marissa. Shannon. Not here. Not here. Okay, that's right. It's in Oklahoma. That's very neat. Taylor. Yeah. Maggie. There you go. Faith. Sorry. It's okay. Tyler. Yu Ting. You got a very good job. Marissa. Again. Maggie. Again. <laughs> Emily. Tyler. Shannon. Not here yet. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor. Faith. And you think. There you go. Excellent job once again. All right, you can look those over for a moment and then we're going to go over them. How do you get a test Yep, that's because it's right here. <laughs> Emily. There you go. Saw it sitting there and I figured I must have left the one there. You all did very well. I was very impressed with your grades. You all seem to have a good understanding of the material. You know, excellent job, everyone. Are there any questions about the test? If not, then we're going to start going over it. Everyone ready? Yeah. Good. We're going to go over the test. Yeah. The we're not going to go over the art lesson. We went over that earlier. Number one, E. Number two, B. Number three, M. Number four, A. Number five, H. Number six, F. Number seven, O. Number eight, L. Number nine, K. Number ten, D, 
Number 11, Q. Number 12, I. Number 13, N. Number 14, R. Put them together, what does it spell? Nothing. <laughs> Number 15, B. Number 16, D. Number 17, C. Number 18, A. Number 19, D. Number 20, A. Number 21, D. Number 22, B. Number 23, D. Number 24, A. Number 25, Charles Dickens. Number 26, Big Business. Number 27, Experts. Number 28, Cheaper. Number 29, Technology. Number 30, Steel. Number 31, Electricity. Number 32, Telephone. Number 33, Death Rates. Number 34, Urban Renewal. Number 35, Evolution. And number 36, Schools. Does everybody understand that? Is everybody happy with their grades? Okay, when you are finished looking at your grades, you can bring up those tests and place them face down right here. And then, wait for it, take your new Strengthening Germany packet. We're going to work on that in small groups. Well, 10 minutes, so we should be able to get that done. Or at least very close to being done. And that will feed directly into this lesson tomorrow. We're going to explore. It is chapter 10, section 2. It's going to feed directly into what we were learning about today. After Germany gets together, after it forms itself and coalesces into a single nation, Bismarck and the German Kaiser set out to make it one of the global powers of Europe, one of the most powerful nations in the world. And we're going to start exploring exactly how that happens and what it means for the other nations in Europe and why they become so threatened by the growing German power. This was a very dynamic time in European history. small groups as well. You don't have to work on this alone, although if you choose to, that's fine. As long as you keep a respectable volume. If you have any questions, once again, I'm here to help. So anything that you don't find that you need help with, that's what I'm here for. If any of you would like to use your bonus points that you earned in the other activity, please see me like to boost your grade on the test, although everyone's done very well, so I would maybe hold on to those.
from this point on, we're also going to begin collecting these uh, note packets. What I'm going to do is call you up one at a time, not at this point yet, but coming up soon, this packet or the next one, and we're going to, I'm going to look at them, make sure that they're completed, stamp them, and give you 10 points. So that way I wanted to ease you into these packets and then start grading. And that'll happen periodically throughout the rest of the time that I'm here to make sure that everyone's doing it. workers. That's because of the large population. Germany also experiences a population boom at this time. Families were doing well. They could afford to have more children. So you start seeing more and more German families having more children. Germany becomes an incredibly populous nation, especially for Europe. We only have about a minute left now. So I would start packing your things up getting everything together. Make sure that you bring your books and these packets tomorrow. We're going to be using them. Once again, everybody, excellent job on your assignments. I was very impressed and very good job.